This is Matthew Cratter's Bitcoin University. Today I want to talk about the big mistake that Satoshi made, and none of what follows is in any way intended to disparage Satoshi or the gift that he gave to humanity. Satoshi really created and set in motion the best money and the best monetary network that the world has ever seen. And Satoshi's invention is the culmination and synthesis of many different inventions that came before, including Adam Back's hash cash and many other cypherpunk contributions. When designing Bitcoin, Satoshi needed to pick and advance multiple parameters that can never be changed. And he, as he himself said, quote, the nature of Bitcoin is such that once version 0.1 was released, the core design was set in stone for the rest of its lifetime. Some examples of parameters that Satoshi picked, for example, the 2016 block difficulty adjustment for mining after every 2016 blocks, the 210,000 block having schedule, and also the 50 Bitcoin initial block subsidy that halves according to the halving schedule, and thus leads directly to the implied 21 million coin max supply. What's really amazing is how many things Satoshi got right. As Adam Back points out here, it's genuinely surprising, but by all evidence, it appears very hard to significantly improve Bitcoin's fundamental design. Most trade-offs improving aspects make other properties worse. By curious happenstance, Bitcoin exists in a narrow optima in the near infinite design space. And that's what Satoshi did so well, is he was able to pluck out a few parameters from this infinite de design space and create something that's incredibly robust and that is still working today. So Satoshi got many, many things right. But if I had to name the biggest thing that he failed to anticipate or got wrong, it would be this. It would be the rise of Bitcoin mining pools. Now, mining pool is when, rather than solo mining, people get together with their Bitcoin mining rigs and contribute their hash towards finding the next block. Note that you can point your hash over the internet to a mining pool without your mining rig physically being in the same place. So for example, you might be able to mine with a Chinese mining pool from the US, just pointing your hash there. It's very different. The mining pools are very different from mining farms where all the ASICs, all the mining rigs are there together. Whereas mining pools are a much more virtual thing where you point your hash. In a mining pool, people split the mining rewards based on how much hash they've contributed towards finding the block. So for example, if you're contributing 1% of the hash, you'll receive 1% of the mining reward, which is just the 3.125 Bitcoin, plus the transaction fees for every transaction that's been included in the block. FPPS complicates this, but that really is a subject for another video. I just pause really briefly here to ask you if you're finding this video helpful so far to please help support this channel's educational mission. Hit the subscribe button. That does really help. Leave a like, leave a comment, question, suggestion for a future video, and share this video with a friend or family member. So what's the main reason that people choose to mine Bitcoin together in a mining pool rather than doing solo mining? It's really this. It's to smooth out the variance of Bitcoin block production. Because if you're solo mining, it might take you 40 years to find a block and collect the full reward. And that means 40 years of paying electricity costs and having to buy new mining rigs and never seeing a penny of incoming cash flow or the satisfaction of finding a block. So it makes sense to pool your hash with others and collect smaller mining rewards, but more frequently. And it's these mining pools that really are a, de a development that Satoshi clearly did not anticipate. So here's how Bitcoin worked in the old days of Satoshi. You just downloaded the original Satoshi client and ran it like Hal Finney did when he says running Bitcoin, he means he downloaded the program and he is running it. It's just a single program. This original version of the software contained many different things that have now been split apart, but it contained a Bitcoin wallet. It contained Bitcoin node software, which is really the equivalent today of Bitcoin Core or Bitcoin Knots. And it also included mining software, Bitcoin mining software. And I believe if I got this right, you just pressed the get get Bitcoin button, and it actually started you solo mining. So this was an all-in-one software. Today, this functionality has been broken up and spread across multiple implementations that include thousands of different Bitcoin wallets, obviously, Bitcoin Core, Bitcoin Knots, and other implementations, other software implementations of the Bitcoin consensus rules for node runners, and also specialized implementations of Bitcoin mining software that's used by different mining pools, as well as what we're going to talk about later in this video, decentralized mining protocols like Ocean's Datum, which allows individual miners, the individual hashers who run the Bitcoin mining machines, to build their own block templates and thus have control over which transactions get included in a block rather than giving this very important job to the mining pool itself. So in many ways, Datum is a return to Satoshi's vision of how Bitcoin mining should work, where every Bitcoiner runs a node, 
and every Bitcoiner is mining Bitcoin and deciding which transactions get included in a block. Now, what's the reason for this? The reason is if you have just a few people in the world deciding which transactions go into a block, then Bitcoin is not sufficiently censorship resistant. And that's where we are today, where we have just 19 pools and we really have just a, a few large pools. We have Foundry in the US, we have Ant Pool, which is really a pool of pools that includes all the different the different uh, Chinese Bitcoin mining pools. We have pools like Maro, who are mostly responsible for the spam in the US. And then we have a bunch of smaller pools. But today, Bitcoin mining pool pools are highly centralized. And there are just a few of them that make most of the blocks. As a result of this, today, Bitcoin is no longer that censorship resistant, but rather instead relies on the good graces of the large mining pool operators who get to decide which transactions go into a block. And since the large pools produce most of the blocks today, if they ever reject a transaction, i.e. refuse to include it in a block, it could take a while for that transaction to find its way into one of the much less frequent blocks produced by one of the smaller pools or even by solo miners. So we haven't seen real much real censorship yet, but it's a real risk and things need to change before it's too late and there's ever a global government crackdown on Bitcoin. Right now we're protected by the fact that the US and China are not getting along very well. So it's unlikely to see Foundry collude with these other mining pools out of China, but that may not last forever. Today, individual miners or what you might call hashers who run mining rigs, who run these ASICs, usually don't get to decide which transactions go into a block when they point their hash at a mining pool. And instead, hashers are forced to accept the block template and included transactions that the mining pool sends them to hash to do work on. This is never how Satoshi intended Bitcoin mining to work, as we can see from the Bitcoin, uh, the Bitcoin white paper. This is from uh, section number five, talking about the network. Each node collects new transactions into a block. Each node works on finding a difficult proof of work for its block. When a node finds a proof of work, it broadcasts the block to all nodes. So what we can see here is that each of the nodes is not only running just regular node software, but each of the nodes is a mining node as well. And the way this works, as Satoshi points out, he was already aware of the possibility of 51% attacks when he wrote also in the white paper, the system is secure as long as honest nodes collectively control more CPU power than any cooperating group of attacker nodes. And this is back when the difficulty of mining Bitcoin was very, very low. So you could mine it using a CPU on your laptop. Then that gradually moved on to GPUs. And now you can only mine Bitcoin efficiently with ASICs as a result. But in this world of very few mining pools, most of which are very happy to include spam into their blocks, and in a world where the most popular software implementation of the Bitcoin consensus rules, namely Bitcoin Core, where this is tr where Bitcoin Core is tripping over itself to accommodate mining pools and crypto VCs who like spam, a world where rather than taking care of its real customers, which are the Bitcoin node runners, Bitcoin Core wants to completely blow open old spam filters like OpReturn, which we've been talking about for the past week, while also refusing to add new filters to stop new attacks like the inscriptions hack, for example, Here's what we risk. We risk ending up with a Bitcoin blockchain that is chock full of spam, full blocks paying high transaction fees that will more than offset the decaying block subsidy as it halves from 3.125 Bitcoin to half of that to half of that. And then you risk ending up with this Bitcoin blockchain full of spam and administered by just a few corrupt mining pools like Mara that are more than happy to boost quarterly profits while contributing to a massive tragedy of the commons by spamming the chain. A Bitcoin blockchain full of spam and controlled by just a few mining pools, with the majority of nodes having been neutered by Bitcoin Core's malicious tampering with the filters, this is not a version of Bitcoin that has any neutrality, any decentralization, any censorship resistance, or even a supply cap. And unfortunately, that's where Bitcoin is trending today. And it's a dark future where Bitcoin is not worth that much either as an asset, because who really wants Mara spam chain tokens? That's not what I came to the space for. And if this dark future comes true, it's not just Bitcoin that's going to continue to trend down, but also MSTR, 
and the Bitcoin spot ETFs like IBIT and the MicroStrategy, the strategy derivatives like MSTY and everything else will trend to zero because what's the value of Mara spam chain tokens? That's not something anyone's interested in. So how to restore Satoshi's vision of how Bitcoin should work? There are two things. Number one, Bitcoin nodes need to reassert their control of the network and do everything they can to filter out spam at the relay and mempool level. Running Bitcoin knots is the best solution today. It has the best filters and the best configurability. The Bitcoin community also needs to call out shame and expel bad actors who advocate for spam. And the Bitcoin community needs to reverse mining pool centralization by embracing alternatives like Datum that return the power of block template construction to the people. This is Datum, which I'll put a link to in the description notes below. Our mission is simple, return control of block templates to the miners as it was intended in Satoshi's white paper, as we've discussed in this video. By doing so, Datum ensures that miners, not pools, decide which transactions get added to the blockchain. So I'll put a link to this if you want to read about Datum from Ocean Mining. I'll also put a link to this if you want to learn how to install Bitcoin Knots. There's a video, a short video I made, as well as a longer video by BTC Sessions and a very good video as well by Cole. So I'll put a link to that in the description notes below. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the subscribe and like buttons. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.